Hello and welcome to another episode of BB's Finds. I'm Blake B. This is the only show on YouTube where a guy extemporaneously talks about his collections while sitting in a closet that's shared with his wife. As you can see, the wife's clothes are behind me. I'm not going to discuss those today. Uh, this episode is very special because of a couple of reasons. I haven't done a I haven't done an episode in a while. Um, two, uh, it it there's really nothing to show. Um, I have stuff in this genre. Um, from from you know a long time ago but it's 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 really not even worth going through um because of what i'm about to discuss um today's topic is the sports the current sports cards craze um economics um it's simple economics to me um so uh i guess my history because i do talk about history on this my history when i was a kid i collected sport i started collecting sports cards in 1989 um, I remember buying my first pack of 1989 tops at a Toys R Us, and from then on, um, was pretty much uh, enamored with the statistics um, and just collecting for fun, trying to complete sets, putting cards in order. So it's it's more just like the the more cerebral aspect of collecting rather than upside collecting. Uh, however, in 1990, a card came along that kind of changed that and changed the way that people thought about. Um, uh, collecting that card was the Bo Jackson, uh, 1990 score black and white card where he's got the football shoulder pads on and he's got the bat. Um, that card was at one time projected to be worth a lot of money. Um, but because of economics, the laws of economics, supply and demand, um, most people who have that card now know that it's uh, virtually worthless unless it's in super, super, super good condition. Um, the, uh, kind of this kind of the other aspect from when I was a kid that you know I I did get a lot of joy out of collecting but um I, I was always, always told by like my parents friends and other people that you know there it was always the same story my my at the time there was like 1952 Mickey Mantle cards and things like that that were talked about and they, they are still talked about today um but you know the the kind of the the refrain was um the uh the same story everyone's parents threw away their sports cards and they wish they had them um i i happened to go through all my sports cards like that i collected with my brother about i don't know five years ago or so and salvaged all or most of the um <clears throat> the rookie cards and hall of famers and you know things like that so i've got you know i've, I've whittled down essentially you know it, it seemed like it was about a half a closet full of stuff to maybe uh two or three shoe boxes full of stuff so um, dumping all the commons and just players I don't care about. Um, again, I collected it in what's referred to as the junk wax era where supply was just crazy. The, the card companies were just making so many of these things that it took away any true value, any true sustainable market value they had long-term. Um, uh, there was demand, uh, for cards at the time, but it wasn't like it is now. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, the, uh, the cards were, typically readily available uh, at that time in junk wax era uh, from both retail shops and from um, uh, card stores like specialty card stores uh, the, the um, there wasn't as many chase cards back then as there is now where there's a limited it, it's like manufactured scarcity essentially where there's a limited number of cards a special type of cards uh, with signatures and jersey pieces and things like that on it that they have now or there's just numerous um, sets and subsets and but kind of uh kind of just a weird market saturation of uh chase cards and having people it's like it's almost like playing the lottery i'm gonna i'm gonna keep referring to that playing the lottery getting lucky playing the lottery getting lucky um over and over uh so the uh the um yeah so so the junk wax era in the 1990s i i took a pause i took a beat from collecting for a lot for a while after that i think i as i grew into like playing sports and working and um you know, just studying and having video games and things to occupy my time. Uh, I still like statistics, baseball statistics and, um, uh, and hockey statistics in particular. Basketball statistics are, uh, were never really um, that enamoring to me. Uh, neither were football statistics, but for some reason, baseball and hockey statistics, I think baseball will always be probably the, probably the number one because baseball is such a weird sport when it comes to um a chance possibilities outcomes things like that so that's why i liked collecting the cards is to have that that to capture the um actual statistics of the, the players year after year uh from the rookie years down to where they were currently or the last season um so that's that um so the 
um, the, the second time I collected cards was a very brief stint in 2007. Um, I caught wind of a news story uh, about a Derek Jeter tops card that was uh, that had a picture of uh, George W. Bush, the president at the time, as well as Mickey Mantle on it. Um, and people were uh, it was sort of a, a cool thing for me to do. Like just it seemed like a, it seemed like an interesting thing. Interesting enough. Um, I my my interest in in uh, in the statistics element of it has sort of waned over the years as I you know, don't collect anymore and don't play fantasy sports as much because it's, that's very time consuming, especially baseball. Um, we have to change lineups every day, but, um, I, uh, I think I, I think I spent, you know, a good week or two looking for the card and finally was able to crack a pack and get it and put it in a hard case. And now it's, it's, (laughs) I was chasing value, um, where I think the misnomer is for a lot of little guys like me, um, non-dealers, you know, people that, people that haven't been doing, people that don't have experience with, uh, uh, a card, um, selling, bought, purchasing and selling, um, as a full-time gig. Um, but you know, it did bring me a little joy to, to do the chase and it kind of r- reminded me of being, um, being young again in that junk wax era. Um, so today let's talk about today's environment. Um, probably, probably the biggest thing to talk about is the economic overall economic environment. Uh, right now we have pretty low interest rates. The feds have, have, uh, have pretty much said that they're going to be low for another couple of years. Stimulus, uh, stimulus money. So people are, that are still in the workforce are getting, um, you know, people that aren't making uh, that much money are still getting some stimulus money put in their pockets. Um, so there's, uh, there's basically cheap, uh, uh, credit card, you know, spending uh, to to invest and try to turn around short term profit, and the stimulus money is 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 like play money for some people um, that that don't need the money for uh, their their monthly expenses, you know, their month their their living their ne- necessary expenses, living expenses, things like that. So um, the uh, the the kind of the where I'm getting what I'm getting with this is there's a lot of um, people that are getting enamored by the um, the current sort of surge or, um, uh, a boom of sports cards, resurgence of sports cards. A lot of it's modern era cards that they're getting professional, professionally graded, um, uh, mostly through a company called PSA. Talk about them as well. Um, but the, the, the question in my looming in my mind in, 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 as a student of a lifelong student of economics is, um, is there, is there a bubble here? Um, I, I don't have any skin in the game, but I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, I'm very interested in the the uh, the economics behind this. Economics, by the way, is not um, it's not economics is an is, is is all about human decision making, about um, about uh, committing to something, about not committing to something for certain reasons. It's not about money. Money is a way. Money and numbers are a way to quantify economics, but the, it's ultimately comes down to decision making. And I firmly decided that I am not going to get into the modern card um, modern card for investing. Uh, or or collecting at all, um, and, I'll, and the, here are the reasons why. Uh, first, um, well, let's talk about the the press that this is getting. Uh, there's many other YouTube videos and things like that 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 are out there that people are discussing this right now. Um, a lot of people are talking about the card boom. Um, I think I think people are starting to think more a little bit more. At least the dealers that have been in this for thirty years and have seen have, you know thirty plus years and seen some things, are are starting to think that it's it's almost junk wax era all over again because the supply side is, um, the supply side is is pretty much is pretty much controlling this this whole thing. Um, uh, celebrity purchasing of of high graded PSA cards. I think there was some some stories about that in in the recent past where people are purchasing high grade uh, even Pokemon cards, um, uh, graded what's called the PSA ten, which is like a gem mint card. It's the highest grade you can get uh, through the PSA grading system. Uh, so some celebrities are purchasing cards that way and making new. Then there's new stories about it. So people are saying, oh, I've got Pokemon cards lying around. Maybe I can make money. Um, but we'll get there. Um, Target and Walmart, uh, both retailers. Um, a lot of people are buying uh, in quantities um, their inventory of sports cards completely out of out of stock. The last couple of times I was at Target, that was the case. Uh, the only the only type of cards that were there were were modern era Magic cards. Uh, Pokemon cards were gone. The Yu Gi Oh cards were gone. All the sports cards were gone. There were signs posted that said, um, you know, uh, line up here. You know, come back on on Friday each Friday at eight a.m. in the morning for um, 
uh, for first come first serve for, for sports cards. We're only putting them out one day at a time. So basically the, the retailers are, are, are signaling, signaling some sort of shortage or signaling some sort of rarity, signaling some sort of demand. The problem is that's all a fallacy because, because the uh, card manufacturers are still printing these, printing the, um, the cards in, in, in quantity. Um, because of the demand, uh, I don't know if the card manufacturers are going to resort to the levels of junk wax era printing of cards, but I think for the most part, it's supply side econo- supply side control economics, um, where they're able to, um, just, uh, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, even at a retail level, there's, there's the, the suppliers are still making money. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm guessing to say there's going to be some news stories on this as well, local news stories and things like that. I can see people talking about just because it's a human interest. It's, it's a human interest story. Anytime you see a line for anything, video games or, um, uh, you, you know, the, the new, the newest video game systems, uh, oftentimes there's news stories on that. Um, so there's, it's a, it's a lot of, there's a lot of purview to the public. And because of that, there's a lot of, uh, um, uh, th- there's a lot of visibility and people are, people that may not be even inclined to to uh, participate in this in in sports cards may be more inclined after they see the video and the investment potential uh i however think that's a fallacy uh i'll tell you why <laughs> that's coming up um so in terms of modern cards i think that i think the way you have to really play it is to get lucky on many levels uh, it's not just it's not just pulling a card out of a pack and that, then you're done. Um, you have to you have to one you have to hit a card that that's in high demand. You have to hit a card that is has some sort of um, in, intrinsic value to it because it's because of a player or because of the nature of its of its uh, rarity. Most of these are chase cards that are limited in numbers. Um, then secondly, you have, uh, most of the people that are making any real money on this have to go get the cards graded by PSA. Um, Right now, uh, it costs about twenty dollars a card to get it graded. So there's additional capital outlay to get a card graded, and, and you're not paying for um, an opinion of price. It's not like a valuation or an appraisal. You're paying for an assessment of the condition of something. So you're paying tw- someone twenty dollars to tell you uh, they give you a one through ten score. Um, there's various. There's like five or six variables. Um, you know, corners, edges. Uh, uh, make sure there's no scratches on the on the face of the card. Whatever. Um, all averages out to a 10, then you're, then you're probably looking good because there's, there's usually pretty low populations of tens, but if everyone's sending their, their cards into PSA, um, which they kind of are right now, then there's less popular, there's less chances of it, of you having the 10, the 10, 10 PSA card because other people are sending their stuff in. Um, it, and then not only do you have to get a card graded and wait for the grade to come back, but then you have to find a buyer willing to pay your price. And a wise man once told me, a card's only worth what someone will pay for it. A card's only worth what someone will pay for it. Okay, so let's think about that in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, how do you find a buyer? I think the easiest way to do this is online a lot. So people are relying on these, these uh, historical sales data from eBay and other, you know, auction type sites and things like that. Um, it's all, it, but you know, all these, all, all this luck energy or all this luck. Uh, um, all these luck elements combined, it, it's, 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 it's akin to playing the lottery. Um, it's, it's really a fool's errand in my mind to crack packs for value. Um, expected value. If you look at boxes, um, of cards, prices of boxes of cards, uh, versus the expected value of cards for anything. It's like, it's like driving a car. It's like driving a car off of a car lot. The value goes down as soon as you get out of there. It's, it's, it, and it's like 50%, you know, it's like, it's, it's substantial. Um, so it's basically this big luck element that, that, um, is going on. Uh, I think that, um, uh, in terms of the PSA grading, we'll talk about that for a minute. So again, you're, you're paying for, you're paying for someone's opinion of, of the condition of something. It, it, how what condition it's in you're paying them twenty dollars per card for the condition if it's in so if you're if you you have a card that you think you can maybe get if it can get a psa 10 uh you can sell for a hundred dollars you're already you're already two, 20 bucks in the hole plus you have to wait uh we have to wait a specified amount of time currently psa is not even accepting accepting cards they're not accepting cards. They have a 10 million card backlog currently, right now, a 10 million card backlog, and they're not accepting any more submissions until July of this year. So what does that mean? That means PSA is actually walking away with 
$200 million, at least, in revenue from grading, uh, just the, just what's in their backlog currently. I think they're probably the real winners in this in terms of the, in terms of the money. Um, now, what, um, you know, what, what this means is you really can't, in terms of like, in terms of buying something, putting it on your credit card and then selling it that month to recoup your costs and then pay what your credit card off, that's not going to happen because there's a time lag. So if you're throwing a bunch of money at it on a credit card, you're, you're screwed until, until at least July. Um, if you're, if you're going to get something PSA graded, uh, now I think this is, this is essentially a, um, sort of a 1% versus 99% deal, meaning that the 1%, the people at the top are ma- are the ones really making the money. They're the, they're the ones who are really uh, profiting from this. Um, and these, a lot of these guys are dealers who understands the, in- understand the int- intricacies of the markets, uh, stuff that I'm talking about right now. They understand the game. It's a game. Um, they're playing the game. It's a lot like um, stock stocks in some respects. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, I think just personal opinion here. I think a lot of a lot of the a lot of the stuff that's happening, a lot of the movement that's driving the prices, these crazy prices, is dealers basically just trading cards and money back and forth, driving the prices up, artificially inflating market prices. Meaning the, the meaning the market prices are what people are seeing online is is not actually correct um, to true market value. Uh, meaning the end consumer, the end consumer. I mean. It's, does someone really have that much expendable income? Jordan rookie cards, perfect example. PSA 10 Jordan rookie cards a year ago, 250K. PSA 10, understandable. Um, the greatest of all time. A lot of people refer to, you know, a lot of these big card sales uh, with greatest of all time athletes. Um, Jordan, definitely the greatest of all time, in my opinion, for his uh, his basketball skills. And um, I don't think he'll ever be, you know, there's talks of Kobe and LeBron. No, I mean, it's Jordan for me all day. Um, but you know, would I be willing to pay $250,000 for a Jordan card? I don't think so. I don't have that kind of, first of all, I don't have that kind of, um, scratch. (laughs) I don't have that kind of expendable income, that kind of money laying around. Uh, had, had I seen a Jordan for, you know, a Jordan rookie or a pack of, you know, whatever Fleer cards from 86 or, you know, whatever year it was at a thrift store, yeah, I'm going to take that gamble because it's a thrift store and it's, it's a, it's a, it's, I, I'm, I'm mitigating my risk. I'm, I, I'm not, um, and, and the capital outlay is pretty low. So, so from an investing angle, I mean, if I find, if I find cards at a, at a thrift store in this, in some market where, where they're not aware of market conditions, that's like perfect, but that, that never happens. Never. I can tell you 100% every single card that I've ever seen in a thrift store is junk wax era. Um, so, and I go to a lot of thrift stores and I've been doing this for a long time. Um, so card, uh, let's talk about, uh, card shares next. So another way that these dealers at the top, these 1%, I guess you can call them. I, I, I just view them in my mind as dealers and just guys who are just trading things back and forth, you know, briefcases full of cash and, and cards and cases. You can think of it that way. Um, so, so these people, there's some people that are selling what, what's known as like card shares. So you have a Michael Jordan rookie card. Well, let's back up. So, so. Before before we get there, the Jordan card is now PSA ten. A year later, seven hundred and forty thousand dollars, I think, was the last one that was sold. PSA ten. So, so what that tells me is there was some inf- market influence or some some someone willing to pay that price for the card. Now, I I don't know if it was because of the Last Dance documentary that was released that renewed interest in Michael Jordan and basketball and sports cards. Um, but I I have a theory that it's just inflated prices similar to a pump and dump scheme in stock. Um, which brings me to the card shares. So there's also this thing right now where people are, um, uh, dealers are, are selling off shares of a card. So you can basically buy 10% of a, a card um, for a spe- specified price. Um, they get 10 investors. And then when the, when the card sells, those investors get paid. The dealer, um, the dealer distributes the money, makes a little bit of a profit on the, on the thing. But the problem with this is there could be a, the, that same dealer and the same dealers that are involved with this could have duplicates of that card at the same condition, same value or same uh, PSA condition. They could be um, in theory, driving the price of the card up artificially to sell another card at the same price. So it's, it's, it's kind of a win-win for those that, that have the ability to do that with, with the actual card itself, with the product. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a, 
I mean, it's it seems like a little bit of a, a stretch maybe but to think of that way, but I think that's what's going on. I think that that's probably the only way to explain what's going on and why market value has increased so much in a very short period of time. Um, because I don't think it's end consumers. I don't think it's middle class people that are, you know, even people in the, in the higher class that are, that are paying this much money for cards. It just doesn't make any sense. No sense whatsoever. Um, so I, yeah, again, I think these, the, the share, the, the card share situation or card share scenario, even selling to someone who's in, you know, in cahoots, uh, like almost like a collusion element, like, uh, I get. I have a Jordan card. Perfect example. I got. I have a Jordan card. I want to sell it market value for seven hundred forty k. I get ten investors who come in at seventy four thousand a piece. I, I end up selling the card to my buddy for eighty. My dealer buddy for eighty thousand, who's got another Jordan PSA at the same same value. Uh, eight, eight, sorry, eight hundred thousand. So I, I walk away with a, a a little bit of a profit from from doing the deal. Probably some management fee or something. The, the other guys get paid a little bit of profit too. The investors get paid. It drives the price up even more. To Now we're talking 800000 The other guy, because he pays the 800000 can turn around and find someone, uh, a shark, you know, who, who's who's basically someone who's who's just willing to pay 800000 because they see empirical market data and they're they're willing to just outlay that cash for, for that type of investment. Um, now, I, I, I'm pretty sure this is, what, this is what's driving the price on the very high end stuff. Um, I, in fact, I'm willing to even go as far to say is if there was such thing as a sports cards, e, uh, ETF, um, I'd be willing to short it. Um, because I, I, I don't see this market being sustainable for very long. Um, again, history is, history seems to be repeating itself. You know, we talked about Jordan rookie, but these modern cards that people are chasing, it just doesn't make any sense. Junk wax era, the 2007 Jeter. I mean, it just, it just seems like history repeating itself. Um, in, in, I, you know, personally, I don't, I don't find from an economic angle that it makes much sense to, uh, put anything into this, this market, uh, based on, based on how I'm viewing it and kind of what I know and, 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 what could be um there's also <clears throat> there's also a, a slim possibility that there's some people at psa that are getting um it, it's just a theory in my mind but some people at, at the psa grading company that are either friends with these dealers or um are getting some sort of a side uh kickback for giving a higher grade than um uh, the card really, the card itself really warrants, which takes away from sort of the ethics of the profession and things like that. I don't want to get into it, but there's, there is the possible, I guess there is, what I'm saying is there is a possibility for that much similar to the, uh, bond ratings in the, in the 28, uh, uh, mortgage crisis, um, where the bond, co- bond companies were overrating bonds that were just, you know, way, wor- way, way worse than they really were. And then trying to package them off as good investments to, to, uh, to, uh, consumers like you know middle people that middle class people that were buying the investments um my conclusion uh i have no skin in the game like i said so i'm i'm staying the heck away from cracking packs for value um it's it's a fool's errand to crack packs for value um if you're gonna crack packs you do it for joy you do it for the love of the item uh this 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 card collecting hobby is is a lot different than say record collecting because with the record collecting you actually play the records typically most people some people collect sealed records but you typically play the records uh toys you build the toys you know sometimes people keep them in in cases or you know in their uh boxes and things like that but for the most part i you know consumers are gonna are um i think the, these items like a lot of these items are typically meant for cons- consumption in cards typically a kid's hobby um the joy in this, my, you know, my version of my joy was looking at the statistics on the cards and things like that. Um, again, I would short the sports card market if I could, um, based on what I know, there's a huge bubble, just, it's going to happen. I mean, the writing is on the wall. Um, the, uh, if there were, if there were ETFs or anything like that, I'm, I'm kind of keeping my ear to the ground to see if there's any exchange trade funds, exchange traded funds, uh, that, that, uh, have, um, sports cards as their underlying investment, similar to like how they have gold, some gold ETFs and things like that. Um, you know, it's just, it's weird because the, uh, consumer tastes, um, you would think that economics are in, 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 influenced mostly by consumer tastes, but it seems like the consumer taste in this, this opinion is basically a get rich quick, get rich quick scheme. Um, and the market is, is, 
is pretty bullish on the upside investing, um, which is just, uh, it's just a little bit, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's kind of telling to me. Um, investing, if I were to invest, I would invest in probably pre-1979 graded cards, or sorry, pre-1974 graded cards. I got to go back a little bit further. Um, it, just in high grade because those are those have true rarity those are th those are truly rare and not manufactured scarcity those are cards that um will forever hold value uh i think like you know if i if i had if i had endless capital uh 1952 mickey mantle would be probably the number one choice for me um so that being said this is uh this has been another episode of bb's finds uh didn't share anything today with you um, physical items. I got my hands here that I talk with sometimes. Um, but, uh, just talk a little bit, but a little bit about economics and, uh, my outlook on this sports cards. Boom. I uh, hope you all have a good weekend and take care.